very warm welcome to all the Siplaites tuned in for this amazing session. Extremely delighted to be here with you today as part of our International Women's Month. Choose to challenge speaker series where we have conversations with women leaders across the industry. Our speaker here today is Ms. Amira Shah. She is the promoter and managing director of Metropolis Healthcare a reputed chain of pathology labs with a customer base across India, South Asia, and Africa. She has played a pivotal role in changing the pathology industry landscape in the country. Over the last 20 years, Amira has focused on delivering sustained growth, and under her leadership, Metropolis raised the bar of diagnostic accuracy, customer experience, and empathetic services. She has many honors. She has been honored as a 215 Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum. She was named among Fortune India's most powerful women in business in 2017, 18 and 19. Amira also features in Forbes Asia's Power Business Women list in 2020. She is also an independent director on the board of several Indian companies and an advisor to the Baylor College of Medicine, Texas. If I go on and on with her achievements and we will be here all day. So now I'm going to welcome Amira and thank you so much. And what a delight to be here in conversation with you today. Thanks so much, Ramana, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here as always. And, uh, you know, I'm thankful that you cut that short because it was getting a bit embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> embarrassing but true and that's why you know Sipla it's one I want to hear from you especially because unfortunately it's 2020 but women entrepreneurs especially here in India are still a rarity and a topic of discussion and intrigue um, so so what what do you think uh, as, as you know a leading entrepreneur yourself um, let us know what your thoughts are Entrepreneurship is hard, I think, wherever you are, and in India especially. Uh, you know, there are a lot of challenges. You know, where government policy is not stable. Um, you know, you do, there is a lot of sort of, there aren't organized, structured networks through which you can sell products and services. Often, your first business is uh, funded by your uncle or your chacha or your mama <laughs> or somebody like that. Um, you know, yeah. if not your father. And, and you tend to get your first contracts through these informal channels of family. Um, or friends and that's why uh, men tend to succeed more than women because they tend to have more of these informal networks in the business world simply because of their gender and the fact that they've been born in business families and their fathers know xyz etc uh, usually the daughters in these families uh, don't get the same opportunities it's unfortunate but true uh, because usually even if they go to their chacha or mama and say look i'm trying to fund this business you know why don't you be my first customer or whatever they'll instead try to convince the daughter of the family that, look, you know, why are you wasting your time with this? And we'll find you a good boy and you settle down and you focus on your children and da, da, da. So what happens at every stage of a woman's life, uh, she lands up actually not getting encouragement, but, this, you know, actually the actual active discouragement from members of the family and friends uh, in terms of wanting to do anything adventurous in her life because the full focus tends to be about protecting the girl child. Um, and, and rather than exposing her and giving her the ability to protect herself. And that's very different for boys. So generally women grow up, you know, not growing up in this very protective shell of complete certainty where they don't have to make difficult decisions, where everything is presented for them. Somebody else is making the decision for them. How can you be trained to therefore be an entrepreneur when you're not comfortable with risk? When you're not comfortable with decision making, when you're not comfortable with, uh, you know, having that sense of responsibility of having to make trade offs in life, it, you're just not trained for it and your mindset is in a totally different direction. So it's because of the conditioning of the way Indian girls grow up is why females becoming entrepreneurs is that much more rare in India. Uh, and even though that we have so many women in India who are doing things from home, baking, sewing, uh, you know, so many things nowadays. Uh, but for them to actually go out and actually rent a shop and actually learn how to price the product or actually go and market, all these things mean that, um, you know, th there will be certain trade-offs in life. And those trade-offs, unfortunately, there's nobody in the family willing to encourage them or give them a helping hand. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it becomes an unsurmountable mountain for them to climb, or they, so they think. 
So, so, so tell me, how did you climb this mountain then, Amira? Because you successfully transformed your uh, father's business into this enterprise that it is today. And the stereotypes that you're talking about, um, where women are not encouraged to take risk or to build a business given capital opportunities, you challenged all of them. And your journey is, is you know, a shining example of what can be. So, so take us through how you challenge the status quo and, and, and you know, built your business. The journey is, I think, like most which uh, have some element of success in it, uh, a matter of luck uh, and a matter of uh, some of my own doing. I would say matter of luck for the family that I was born in, where my parents are uh, extremely, while they're doctors, they're professionals, they had nothing to do with business. Um, you know, they were, they allowed me to have, take those risks at a young age. I went hiking, I went trekking, I went, I, you know, traveled global, you know, I traveled across the world uh, to the US myself when I was 16 years old. Uh, these opportunities are not often given to the girl child. Um, you know, I was allowed to do whatever I wanted in terms of pursue any professional career. When I decided I wanted to be, uh, going to the US to study, I informed my parents and I said, look, I'm going. And and there was no like, no, how can you be so far away from us? And none of that. Um, but there was also something in me that made me take these initiatives myself. Uh, you know, so whether it was, um, you know, deciding I'm going to go to the US and study and then convincing my parents, uh, or whether it was reaching there and then deciding that I don't want to take money from my parents to support my education. And from the first year itself, I started doing, I got a scholarship, I started earning and I paid my own way through college. Not because my parents couldn't afford it, but it was because I had a sense of saying I want to stand on my own feet even though I was just 17 years old. I think some of it comes from your own personality of who you are versus and some of it comes from just pure luck, uh, which I definitely got a lot of. Uh, but, you know, when I was in the U.S., I landed up doing, uh, you know, a couple of internships, one in, in uh, New York, in on Manhattan and Wall Street, uh, and one with a startup. And what I discovered about myself was, while everybody's dream at that time was to become, you know, a Wall Street banker, and say, I just absolutely hated it because I felt like I was one of these 20,000 people in the country. And honestly, I could do anything and it was going to make no impact on the company. Because I was just the bottom of the, the ladder, I was the bottom feeder, right? Versus when I was in a startup of five people, I mattered every day. I was 20% of the workforce, you know, and that meant something to me. That if I didn't come to work, stuff was not going to get done. And, and that made me realize that I would rather lead a small team than be one of the many in a large team. Uh, and, and keeping that in mind uh, and the felt sense that I was quite patriotic, I had seen what Mohamed Yunus had done with Grameen Bank. And I was really excited about the fact that capitalism could also make this amazing positive social impact on society, that it made me come back to India and decided to be an entrepreneur because I want to lead a small team and I want to do something in my country with positive impact. So sort of healthcare India all came together at that point of time for me. And there were challenges, Ramana. I mean, it wasn't easy, you know, being young, I was 20 years old, being female. Uh, my father was a doctor, but he had a running practice. Uh, fortunately, it was not a business at that point. So it actually meant that I could come in, bring my business knowledge, which was marginal at the time, <laughs> and, and actually leave, leave some sort of an impact because my father was a medical guy. So, you know, it was his medical knowledge, but my business knowledge that we sort of brought together and then started to sort of grow it from there. Um, and I think that that really sort of helped um, me be able to find my own style, my own voice, not having to battle the traditional issues of family business where, you know, somebody else is telling you what to do and how to do. And, you know, I, I actually, you know, he and me were sort of very shoulder to shoulder from a very early stage. Uh, and then, of course, he, he sort of took a step back uh, in a few years uh, very quickly. That's amazing. So, I mean, you might have had really, really supportive parents, but ultimately you had, you know, a lot of guts, especially as someone really young to, to take the initiative. What was your biggest challenge while you were building the business? You're in your early 20s, you've come back to India with a lot of like bright ideas. Um, and then I'm sure there were some walls you, you ran into. So it'd be really nice if you could share you know, a challenge that you overcome that that may or may not be gender specific, but would inspire other people who are hoping to, you know, forge a path yeah. like you have. 
So, I mean, there were the traditional issues of gender, age, the fact that I was not medical. Uh, you know, there were there were 40 people in the team at the time. We had one lab uh, and all 40 were medical guys. And healthcare was uh, very much a doctor-led practice. It was not a business. Uh, and, you know, the idea, the first challenge, I think, was making people who were inside the practice actually understand that moving towards being an institution, which also had commercial aspects and being a business, was not a bad thing, but it was going to be a good thing to actually build the sustainability. And and you can be a business and still have social impact and still have good quality and still do a good job. But in the men- in the minds of all of these guys, these were all very separate things. And building a business was this really bad, evil, commercial uh, thing, you know, for like from, from a doctor's point of view. So uh, I think that was the first big challenge, um, you know, which we had to really overcome from a mindset perspective. I would say second, um, you know, my, my father had landed up taking an investment uh, from an investor just a few months before I came in. Uh, and that landed up being a very, very challenging uh, path ahead uh, because this was a bit of a hostile investor who, uh, you know, was not easy to work with, you know, had very different value systems, a very different mindset of what, what he wanted to do. Uh, and that became a very, very tedious path because somewhere we found that there wasn't a clear leader uh, driving forth and I my ideas and vision of what I wanted to do uh, was sort of convinced you know always diluted because there were all these other people who had their own ideas um, and I found that it really was hurting the organization very badly because you know you had multiple chefs uh, no clear decision and this broth which was full of very different values of different <laughs> people uh, it just didn't work and you know we were actually it was uh, it was hurting Metropolis's prospects so I had to um, at the cost of huge personal risk uh, I had to actually face that head on and then decide what I want to do with it in 2015 I landed up um, taking a personal debt of 600 crores at the age of you know whatever Ooh. 33 or 34 um, just so I could you know exit this uh, hostile investor and actually bring my company on track of going towards what I believed was really its true destiny um, and and that was a very stressful period uh, because, you know, in my family, as doctors, you if you make 100 rupees, you spend 20 and you save 80. You never take <laughs> debt, you know, it's like a really bad word. Um, and as professionals, you just, you always live within your means. You know, we always grew up very middle class in, the, in our thinking. Uh, and uh, so that was a big deviation from my family culture or conditioning. Uh, and then I was taking this huge risk. I was betting not only my future, but also whatever wealth had been created for my family from the past 20, 30 years, which was all in the practice at that point of time. Uh, and I remember there were days I would wake up at four o'clock in the morning sweating out of panic. You know, what have I done? Um, and and it, was, it was a very stressful period. But I found that that was a real juncture in my life where I had a choice whether to continue to live in a way that I knew was hurting me hurting my business and was not going to take me to where I needed to go or I could take this huge risk which was going to cause me a lot of short-term anxiety uh, but I was betting on myself I was punting on who I was and what I could do uh, and that meant I could be a complete failure and it meant sinking everything or it meant that I could come out on the other side whole uh, and I came out on the other side whole and more confident uh, and I think to me that was a real life learning uh, on how when they when when stuff gets really bad, the only person that you can really bet on is yourself. Oh, that's a really amazing story. So tell us, Amira, you started uh, at twenty with one lab. Where are you today? Because so we've currently got one hundred and twenty-five labs. We've got about twenty-five hundred centers, uh, mostly in India, but also in a few countries in Africa. Uh, we've got about four and a half thousand employee base uh, from Pakti, where we were. Um, and we're currently a listed company. We went public a couple of years ago. Uh, we've had three rounds of private equity before we went public. Um, so yeah, it's been about 20 year journey now. Yeah, it's an amazing, amazing journey. But I liked what you said earlier about social impact and wanting to give back to India. Um, and I personally had, uh, you know, that experience of doing that, a little bit of that with you last year during um, COVID. Uh, where there was a partnership between Citibank, Sipla Foundation, and Metropolis. And um, we came together for testing in the height of the COVID pandemic. Um, tell me, what, uh, how 
there must have been many challenges that metropolis faced not least people like me calling for their test within 4 <laughs> hours <laughs> yeah because it, it was such a atmosphere of fear um that i think metropolis was somehow all our partners during the journey you know we could trust um that whatever the answer we'd have the right answer and i think your company and and also the people who work with you because when your technician comes to my home he is your ambassador and i must say that they've never let you down and uh, and to train 4000 people many of whom are forward facing is remarkable especially in covid right so in covid your people were going out um yeah. performing even when your labs i mean your retail lab was closed so just one many people wanted to know how you navigated uh, the covid journey uh, professionally it was i would say probably after the incident that i explained to you in 2015 i would say um 2020 March to June was the toughest part of my life. Uh you know it's been a really challenging period. Uh from two three things, right? Just to paint a picture in terms of where we were. I mean one obviously the lockdown had just happened uh in March, mid March, third week of March. Um I had been closely working with the government to frame the testing policy before that for about 10 12 days before that. There was a lot of chaos and confusion. Nobody knew what they wanted to do. We were as leaders of the industry representing the industry and create, trying to create a bridge with the government. Uh but it was a very challenging period. But finally when the testing policy got announced, uh we were asked to provide services within 24 hours of the announcement of the policy, which is just crazy because I mean, you know, in 24 hours you have no instruments, you have no chemicals, uh <laughs> you have no trained people, you have no way for them to get to work. I mean, it was just chaos. And I think we had to just bit by bit think about how to put all these things together. And by the way, we were operating um the whole time uh, even for non-covid. Uh so there was not a day since uh lockdown happened that we've actually had a day off. Uh my people have been working pretty much through you know around the clock. um so while that the non covid business was down 80% uh which also meant that we had all these fixed costs and no revenues like all businesses did we had to figure out the financial piece of it which is how do we pay salaries do we have enough cash in bank you know what is it that we need to cut what do we need to save etc cetera, etc cetera. so that whole piece was going on and at the same time there was a push from central government to say look build capacity for covid because we don't know where this is going but just build capacity So without having any guidance or forecast we just had to start building capacity easier said than done no instruments available no chemicals available it was then convincing our teams uh, to actually come to work and for that what we had to do was really create a feeling for them that we had their back that we would bring them in buses that made them feel safe uh we would uh, make sure that we had booked hotel rooms so that if they didn't want to go back home they could sleep in hotel rooms close to the lab so they don't in- potentially infect their families um you know we had to provide obviously the kind of all kinds of safety gear to make them feel comforted etc cetera, etc cetera. we created a, a employee welfare fund that said that look if you get infected this is what we'll take care of if something happens to you or your family this is what we'll do we just created these things very transparently that very quickly created that feeling of safety and then obviously it really motivated them that look this is the time when all of us in healthcare have to stand up and we can't be bystanders at this point and you know to credit of my team they were full of purpose and full of commitment and that feeling of ownership that this is the time for us to take care of others sort of i dealt with it was um you know just to try to pick up one piece at a time and sort of say look how do we try to fix this and not allow the pressure that we were feeling on a minute by minute basis to percolate down to the team so i really had to absorb this me a lot of pressure that i was getting from sort of levels high and above in government and otherwise and not let it percolate down uh, my team did a fantastic job in sort of making sure financially we were comfortable just with my guidance and motivating the teams uh but it was a real life lesson in managing anxiety managing stress and managing multiple balls at the same time uh and i think what really helped me is just to keep the bigger picture in mind of what we're trying to accomplish and say look let's just give it our best and then after that if there are some balls that slip they slip and that is just part of life and we have to have belief and trust in the institution that we've built that that the way same way it took us 20 30 years to build our reputation 
it's not going to be one month to kill our reputation and people right. will hopefully be patient and understand and even if they have a bad experience which they are bound to in services you can't be 100% perfect but they'll hopefully give us another chance so let's just do our best and then uh leave it <laughs> without driving ourselves mad right. and that's what we did you know? yeah yeah you did and you know you came through for all of us and you were also um had a baby we were just discussing a covid baby so while you were you know dealing with all the push and pulls of the pandemic on your business you were a brand new mom how did you how did you manage that a lot of uh, the uh, you know women i work with are always wearing two hats and they'd love to know how you do it look again i'm i'm very lucky i had a lot of support you know i had um, you know a nurse with me my my husband and i were working from home uh, my parents came and stayed with us while we were all working from home in quarantine and covid um so you know from that perspective i had uh, a lot of help and thankfully the financial resources to be able to take care of all the basic stuff but as most of you know brand new moms know you're feeding 10 hours a day that's something you just can't outsource to anybody else <laughs> you know there's a certain yeah. there's something your baby needs from you you just there's nobody else who can do it and and you know our human body is so interesting as women that when we have children uh you know all your senses geared up you know just you can hear better because you need to because your child will make a sound and you need to suddenly respond so all your senses are geared to uh, bringing up that child and your emotions are are roaring and your you know everything is in that mindset so uh, you know there was this part of my life that needed to me be really soft and emotional and in tune with my baby and my senses up and my emotions up and all of that and there's this other part of my life that needed me to be razor focused rational objective uh you know not get it too emotional about things because there were some really tricky situations where if i had gotten emotional uh my company would have been on a roller coaster ride you know because uh, there were some tough times where we felt we were being treated really unfairly professionally after all the help and the things that we had done for the community and and in those times you feel like oh god i want to lash out or i want to scream from the terrors or whatever it is but you can't and if you do that it ends up having a long term impact on your business yeah so so how balancing those two parts of my life where one minute i was feeding the next minute i was on calls i think was the challenging part and again i think there was two things one i was very clear this was non negotiable for me it was not an option to just say oh somebody else will deal with this so i think the first thing for us women is not to say look how will i manage is to say look i will manage and then figure out how i think that's the first step um i think the second step is not to be afraid uh, to co-opt help and to rope in people that you can even if it means spending a little bit more money it's fine because in the long term aspect of your career building that little bit of extra financial resources that you deploy to get that extra help is totally worth it right if you you have to look at it from that long term perspective a lot of times i hear women say oh you know how can i spend 20 30% of my compensation on paying a nurse or a nanny or a maid or somebody to help me it's not worth it i might as well stay at home and i keep trying to explain that it's not only about the money is only the temporary piece you're going to spend this extra for 3 months 6 months but that time away from your business your from your from your career is going to come back to impact you probably longer term so we have to look at things in long term perspectives rather than in short term perspectives right what is going to be the value of your knowledge if you are out of the system for one year two years three years and then you're back there back in work are you still going to be relevant is it that easy to really pick up and we have seen data which shows it's not so keeping that foot in the door even if it means you're not giving your 100% in that point of time is okay you know and and that was my logic i said look i don't have to be the perfect mom i don't have to be the most perfect entrepreneur in the situation i just have to show up i have to do my best i have to show up and that's good enough without feeling any guilt that i'm not doing enough that's great amira i'm sure a lot of uh, people tuning in are going to find that very inspiring because that's the constant push and pull right women have two jobs and we're always treading a fine balance and doing the dance so it's really nice to hear you say that you know you've also faced the challenges of juggling a call and you know a, a small baby and then no one feels alone because it's not easy and especially yeah, not, not easy given the year you've had uh the year we've all had 
professionally and, and personally. Um, I think uh, women at Sipla are going to feel that they found a friend in you and someone whose uh, you know voice and story is going to inspire them. Are there any parting messages or thoughts that you'd like to share with us? Uh, yeah, you know, I think um, one or two things that I learned, I spent a lot of time in uh, trekking in the mountains and in nature when I was much younger. And the two lessons that really have come back to aid me at this point in time is one, um, that the weather changes every day. And what that means is that you may be, when you're trekking, you may be fully ready for the sun. Uh, and suddenly it may rain and suddenly it may get freezing cold and you have to have the ability to adapt. So the same way when I was about to deliver, I was fully mentally ready. I was going to have the first 45 days of complete peace and quiet with my baby to just be so emotionally connected and in tune after 20 years of just working like a crazy person. Um, and the reality is I didn't have a single day, right? And I had to very quickly adjust my expectation to be okay with the new reality. But adjusting that immediately is much easier to get into action mode, to be able to live with the reality of what it is, rather than keep thinking in my head, oh my God, I never got those 45 days. Oh my God, how am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? Because that negative thought actually bogs us down more than the reality. So I think that's something that actually had that adaptability and moving away from preset expectations has really helped me adjust. Um, I would say the second thing is, um, you know, just like I said, just going the long term, uh, you know, often uh, we plan for things in periods of one year, two years, three years, but very few people actually think in periods of 10 years. Uh, the really great people think in periods of 100 years. Uh, but even if we're able to just be a think in periods of 10 years, when you're making any decision of your life. So I do two things. One, I don't make any big decision about my life when I'm in an emotional state. And number two, I make all decisions of my life thinking in chunks of 10 years. Uh, and I would just urge you to do the same. It's really helped me and I hope it helps you as well. I'm sure it will. Thank you so much for coming and sharing your thoughts and your time with us. My pleasure, really? Ramana. Always great to chat with you. You too. Bye.